Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guests today are Marie and Brian Brennan. In 2012, they founded the Elder Creek Center for the Land, located in the Omlaki hom- homeland of the Sacramento Valley, with the purpose of normalizing sane human attitudes and practices toward the community of life in the watershed. <sighs> i got to start this over again. I'm not going to delete it. I'm just, I'm just going to... Uh, I cut off the last... I can't believe I did this. I am, like, incredibly incompetent on all this. <laughs> okay. um, well, you're putting what me, Marty. So that's good. Yeah, okay. So I, when, I, when I put in what, what you're... And the greater bioregion, I cut off the word bioregion when I put that in. <sighs> okay. Okay, so we're not going to start the whole thing over. We're going to... Um, I'm going to tell them that there's... When I send it to them, I'm going to tell them there's two, two introductions and to lead up to the second introduction. Okay. okay. Right. Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guests today are Marie and Brian Brennan. In 2012, they founded the Elder Creek Center for the Land, located in the Nomlaki homeland of the Sacramento Valley, with the purpose of normalizing sane human attitudes and practices toward the community of life in the watershed and greater bioregion. So thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, Derek, for having us on the show. Um, So we chose to start the show by having the sound of acorn woodpeckers because they are year-round residents here. Um, They're always around us, and just we enjoy their amazing and varied sounds and activities so much, and they're really a significant part of the spirit of this place. Oh, that's that's great. That's great. You know, that's why I started, when I started this whole radio program, they asked me to provide intro and outro music, and I wasn't really sure, you know, what am I going to do, Beethoven's Ninth or something? I didn't know. (laughs) And I didn't really want to do anything until it occurred to me it could be sounds of nature. And I really want to, to use a word that, that is from your introduction, I really wanted to normalize that as people's understanding of what music is and yeah. of yeah. what, you know, it's just killed me forever that, you know, I can identify probably hundreds if not thousands of advertising jingles for products I will never use, and I know what maybe a half dozen uh, bird songs, maybe a dozen. Um, mm-hmm. right. It's it's just absolutely extraordinary. It's no wonder, once again, that we um, that so much of our allegiance is toward this culture and not toward the land. I mean, we we protect what we know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I'd like to start the official the official interview by um, asking you um, about, and I know that land restoration is is a, a sort of fraught term here. So, but I want to start there, and then and then you can take it wherever you want. So, two two questions in one. Can you tell me about land restoration, and tell me about the land where you live? Uh, well, okay, I'll start with um, sort of a follow up to what Marie was saying about acorn woodpeckers as an answer to the, about the land where we live. Um, of course, acorn woodpeckers live among oak trees, and oak trees are really the defining species of this region. Uh, what I mean by defining species uh, is that the land, you know, the life that is the land, uh, would not could not be the same without oaks. Uh, they provide habitat and food for over 300 species. Uh, they act as a watershed by absorbing water during wet times, and they store and slowly release water during the dry times. So, you know, in essence, oaks provide water for all the neighboring trees, community of life, um, with their amazing and massive root systems. So, um, really, oaks make all the life around us possible, and um, therefore we believe that it's impossible to live appropriately here in this locale without revering oaks um, and depending on them for our very, you know, our own subsistence. for a little more description about the land, you know, other than oaks, we um, are among abundant grasslands and, of course, the narrow strips of riparian woodlands along the creek. The creek, um, Elder Creek, uh, it was historically a perennial creek. And um, in recent times, in the last decade's been really hard. We've had um, declining rainfall. And um, it's gone dry, let's see, it's gone dry about five years out of the last ten for several months each summer. 
Um, this past rainy season, we had only 13 inches of rain. The year before that, we only had 19. And this is a region where historically we get about 36. So you can see um, it's a great concern for us for the life on the creek. Yeah, and it's um, you know it's not a large creek, but the um, watershed runs from the headwaters in the Yola Bully Mountains to the outlet in the Sacramento River in the valley floor. So it really encompasses uh, the most significant biological regions in the North Valley. And unfortunately, like most other creeks in the valley now, it barely reaches the Sacramento River most of the year to all manner of water extraction practices along its course. In our area, uh, primarily irrigating hay fields and orchards. Um, so. You know, if we want to get back to your question about land restoration, I'm going to let Brian talk a little more on that. Well, yeah, let's let's fun. let's let's do do a bit of sort of a a basis first. So, how long have you been there? What was the land like when you got there? Um, how much land are we talking about? And and then and then sort of build from there, if you don't mind. Hmm. Okay, um, I've been here since 2003. And um, you know, I had the pleasure of really experiencing what this place is like during what is called normal rainy seasons, which is that roughly 36 inches of rain in, a, in about a five-month period. And the lushness of growth following or you know tail end of that rainy season is phenomenal here. Um, we are blessed with an abundance of oak trees and um, the quantity of perennial grasses, perennial bunch grasses, that uh, I've recently learned is pretty astonishing for this region. Um, the actual land, the, the, the size of the land that we're fortunate to call home, um, it's about 230 acres. But the bigger watershed is, um, if I recall, it's about 72 miles of linear stream so, you know, we have just a tiny quarter mile section of that that we get to live by. Um, and let's see. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty special place. <laughs> um, and in terms of um, specifics on the land, we, um, you know, we have approached certain aspects of restoration um, more traditionally, but um, at this point, I think we are really in a pretty deep phase of observation. And um, as Brian mentioned, particularly about the, the oaks and the perennial bunch grasses here, um, we, um, in terms of what we would like to do with that, uh, our focus is primarily on uh, helping oaks regenerate because what we see around us is that we have a lot of older oaks. Um, of, of those, there's, there's a fair number struggling just because of this radical change in the amount of water that's on the land. But um, we don't have a lot of, you know, what I would call the, the teenage oaks or we, we get pretty good sprouting, but uh, they just don't make it up to um, a size above that, say, a foot or so. And so, you know, this has been a concern of ours for a long time. And it, it just recently we've really come to the conclusion that the, the main problem is that there's heavy pressure from deer browsing uh, because it's a favorite food for deer. So, um, and because there's not the predators that would have been naturally in this region. The the deer are able to kind of pick and choose their food, so they're browsing down the young oaks. And um, one of the methods we use very directly, and this is just a straightforward restoration method, is just to cage the oaks and, you know, hopefully using salvage materials. But it works, and so, um, you know, that's a quick and easy thing. We think it's really worthwhile to do that. And um, we hope to see, you know, some benefit from that. 
Um, in terms of the bunch grasses, you know, that's a much longer term project that we're working on observing. We can kind of talk more about that as we go into stuff about soil carbon and such. Uh, yeah, and Derek, to get back to changes in the land um, in those 11 years that I've been here, the uh, the main difference really is, is declining numbers of um, frogs, of insects, of, of birds, um, and whether that corresponds directly with rainfall or not, of course we don't we don't know. But there has been a, a significant shift in a much more arid climate. I mean, we used to have a rainy season that was reliable, started in November, pretty much went through April, and now we, we might get some early rains, and then we could easily have two to three months of totally dry weather during the winter, which is when it used to be um, wettest. So what is your, what is your, what is your, you you've sort of said this but but what is your goal there what are you trying to accomplish and both for the land specifically and then when you talked about um you know modeling sane behavior what are you what are you trying to model for other people to pick up what is your attitude toward both what do you want to accomplish in practical terms and then also what are you wanting to uh what what are you trying to get other people to do as well? Well, um, one of the things we've we've come to is that we need to to be effective in this region. And this is a region of not many environmentalists. <laughs> you have to understand. So to be effective, we felt that we need to actually demonstrate on the ground, you know, real world practices. And some of the things are, are rather straightforward and um, even non-confrontational uh, with a lot of the, the neighboring landowners. For example, we, we've recently had an open house and we demonstrated and showed to our neighbors how easy it is to catch rainwater, to have all of your drinking and cooking water supply, even, even enough water for a small garden and, and a few native um, appropriate plants. And, you know, that they can listen to and understand and appreciate because the wells out here don't do so well, the creek's going dry, all those typical normal sources of water um, for d domestic use are drying up. So that's just one little example of, of how we work within the neighborhood with the bigger region and with the landowners. Um, on our land, we've We've undertaken a number of practices um, from sculpting our small garden to catch all the rainwater that does come um, to, like Marie was saying, studying the native perennial bunch grasses. And we've, we've begun grazing with a small flock of sheep as a way to manage those grasses in, in a way that we hope begins to mimic some of the natural ways that these, these grasses evolved with their um, native grazers like um, pronghorn and elk and deer. Um, we've done, we've built little check dams in the creek um, to mimic the types of dams that beavers build because beavers are sorely missing here. I mean, they're present, but their numbers are extremely low compared to what they were in the past. Um, and we know there's there's um, there's other work that is bigger, kind of goes beyond this land um, that we've begun in working with other neighbors. Um, and it's more it's more it's all related to restoration, but it's more um, simply defending the uh, the life that's here. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that you said in a note to me when we were talking about doing the interview, um, you said, we understand why reading our website would lead one to believe that we're restorationists, and we have no problem with that. Um, but the interview provides an opportunity to clarify that our definition of restoration is a little outside the normal interpretation of the word. And what we'd like to convey is that restoration to us is based on increasing biological integrity, 
Um, so a couple things. One of them is that uh, you also mentioned that biological integrity is a core concept and so in, in your work. And so can you, A, define biological integrity, B, define restoration as practiced by the people you would call restorationists, and then C, um, the differences that you see between that and what you're doing, and D, sorry if this is too much at once, D, also, why restoration is crucial, really, for all of us who have access to land. So the first is define biological integrity, or define what, why is biological, what is biological integrity, and how is that a core concept um, to your work? Um, right. Okay, so let's start with that. Okay. Um, Especially in a world being murdered. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So... Um, it's probably easiest just to give you the, the straightforward definition of it and then sort of explain why mm -hmm. that's so important. Um, mm -hmm. So for, for a land base to have biological integrity, it's to have that land needs to have the capability of supporting and maintaining a balanced, integrated, adaptive community of organisms that have a species composition, diversity, and functional organization comparable to that of the natural habitat of the region. Um, it's kind of another way of saying intact <laughs> or or whole. Um, it's almost easiest to describe it as the kind of place that every human knows when they when they find it when they find themselves in a place that has biological integrity. It's just um, something you feel because it's not polluted or it's um, teeming with life or it just really appeals to most or all of our, our senses. Um, and unfortunately, you know, as you say, the world's getting killed. There's there's not too many places left like that. Or if they are, they're, they're small fragments. Um, and in, in our case, you know, we feel like this, this place that we get to call home is, is a fragment of, of that. Um, it's been blessed with 30 years at least without any significant uh, damaging disturbance. Um, now, why biological integrity is important to restoration is, uh, well, uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to let Marie take over. She seems okay. like she's ready to go on this one. <laughs> I will speak on that. Um, so, you know, the, when people talk about ecological restoration, they're usually talking about returning to a former state meaning an original state or, or an unimpaired condition. And the thing is that, you know, with all of the changes that have happened in um, the living world since the arrival of Europeans in California, all of those kinds of things, former, original, are, are really out of the question. So um, it, it has led us to a definition of... Um, what unimpaired means to to focus more on the soil nutrient and water cycles. And when we talk about unimpaired with that, we mean functioning in an evolutionary sense. So meaning life generating, especially uh, in helping support species diversity. And uh, since the ecological foundation of life is water and soil's ability to sustain all terrestrial life is primarily due to its water holding capacity, we think that the restoration of unimpaired water and soil nutrient cycles ought to be the primary goal for humans for the rest of our time on Earth. And, um, you, you know, it's, it is that our very existence depends on clean water and, and fertile soil. I think what you just said is incredibly profound. Could you say that again, please? I really want people to, to understand this. Okay, so for us, restoration is. Um, I meant I meant like the last the last couple sentences of what you said. They were gotcha. incredibly profound. Okay. Um, so since the ecological foundation of life is water, and soil's ability to sustain all terrestrial life is due to its its water holding capacity, we think that restoration of unimpaired water and soil nutrient cycles ought to be the primary goal for humans for the rest of our time on Earth and. You know that I I do think it's profound, Eric, because I feel that um, 
as many listeners of this show probably feel, we have no idea what length of time humans have left on Earth given the state of things. And it, it does feel that the least we can do is to try to restore those most basic uh, elements that are the foundation of life. So, um, you know, that, that, that kind of is our lens for restoration, and it becomes much broader than um, it. And it, it certainly for us applies not only to our locale, but to, to every region. And um, to kind of get more specific of what we mean by that, so uh, aside from energy intensive, mechanistic ways uh, or very precise manipulation of plant communities, it's very difficult to build soil without biological integrity. So we think that biological integrity should be the focus of restoration uh, as, it, as it leads to soil building and healthier, healthier nutrient and water cycles. Uh, and it also creates, through doing that, it creates more complex what they call the community dynamics. So community being a community of species in a given place because it's a result of a primary evolutionary process, um, that of increased biodiversity. And the whole process is ongoing, ever-changing, and sustains itself. Um, another way of saying it is that biological integrity leads to more complexity, which leads to more diversity, which leads to more integrity, and so on. Um, and you know, just kind of going on the restoration thing some more. Uh, you know, I have done a fair amount of what I call the, the pull and plug type of restoration, where you're taking out invasives from an area and usually putting, like, nursery-grown native plants. And I've seen the benefits of this, and, and I am supportive of it in certain circumstances for sure. But I feel it often misses the point of really addressing the underlying stresses that those plant and animal communities are going through and what can be done to help them become more resilient. Um, the other thing about this is that we definitely don't feel that restoration is only about removing invasive species. So if you're looking at the biological integrity of an air area in this way, it becomes clear that invasives can be filling a niche that are helping an area. You and know, actually, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I've got an example of that if you'd like to hear it. Oh, please. Okay. Um, yeah, a few years back, Marie and I were um, <clears throat> pulling up uh, we, uh, what's called a weed, white sweet clover, which was growing along the creek. Um, it had come in pretty rapidly and, and uh, seemed to be taking over. But uh, we weren't sure, so our approach to it was to, to weed out some of it and leave it in other areas to, to observe the difference. And what we discovered is some of those areas where we decided to leave it alone are areas that a few years later had regrown with native mule fat and willow, uh, which are the, the primary riparian species here. Um, so in essence, that white sweet clover, which um, is considered an invasive um, weedy species, was the pioneer species that got the native plant community back on track and back in balance. Because today, five, six years later, there are 12-foot-tall willows growing where that dense patch of um, white sweet clover was growing. You know, I was going to say something kind of similar. And like like you, I recognize the importance of uh, removing invasives sometimes. But I think, for me at least, a lot of times the invasives are more a symptom than once again, not always. There are there are invasives that are really, really nasty and need to be just completely eradicated. Yeah. Um, but I, I know here where I live that um, there was some Himalayan blackberry that was um, really overgrowing some areas. And excuse me. <clears throat> and I took out some of it, but I didn't take out a lot of it, frankly, because it's a lot of work, and I just. You know, I, I wanted to, well, I can either say I wanted to see what would happen or I can say I was lazy, one, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> and what I've discovered now, 15 years later, is that the blackberries are now being uh, slowly shaded out by 
the um, fir and redwoods and alders who mm-hmm. who grew up in their shade and mm-hmm. who were um, protected actually by all the blackberries and so I don't you know I I I'm just saying this to validate what you said that I think that there are times when you know it it is something that needs to scab over the land and then and then something else comes along to to uh to to live there and then the other thing I wanted to mention having to do with the uh, going after the primary causes as opposed to simply reintroducing a species I don't know if you know this but but where I live the frogs have been completely collapsing too and mm-hmm. Um, so of the newts and everybody else, it's heartbreaking. And there's there's one one species about whom I can do something because I know what's causing it. And and for the, for the pond right here, I can do something. Which is there's a mold saprolegnia that has been killing eggs of the Pacific tree frogs. And saprolegnia is everywhere. It's a um, it's supposed to be killing the weak egg sacs. That's not the problem. It's not like the saprolegnia mold is an invasive. Um, but instead, the problem is that with the weakening of the ozone layer, um, that allows more UVB to get through, which weakens egg sacs, which makes the saprolegnia kill off more than it's supposed to. And so what I've been doing in this particular pond, which is very small, is I've been going out, bringing in frog egg sacs, raising – because the, the, the UVB won't go through glass, so I just raise them on my kitchen table, and then I take them back out – and my point is that I'm kind of mixed about this, that I think it's really important because I just want to keep them alive. But on the other hand, I fully recognize that this is not sustainable and that instead, if one can go after, and in this case, I can't go after the original conditions because of the weakening of the ozone layer. But if there are especially local conditions that one can affect the local conditions to um, make it so that the um, – the creatures themselves are able to um, – okay, I'm going to back up again. And years ago, I was doing a talk, and I um, – uh, some guy – I was talking about the need to bring down civilization. And this guy in the audience got really upset and said, you know, you fly around and do talks, and, you know, my carbon footprint is lower than yours, and blah, blah, blah. And so, so – Normally, when people say that, I just go a different direction. But this time, I was kind of annoyed. And I said, you know, I, I put every dime I have into protecting 40 acres of second-growth redwood. And I'm working actively to protect them and doing all this. And so, actually, if you want to get into a pissing contest about our carbon footprint, 40 acres of second-growth redwood, me protecting that is is way, way bigger than me flying somewhere. And he said, well, the question, though, is did you plant all those trees? <laughs> and and it's like wow so my point is that it's really crazy to i mean the point for me it seems and let me know if this is way out base the point of restoration for me it seems is to not plant every single willow tree there but instead do interfere as little as you can in order to help the land in the ways it needs to do it so the land can do what it does best, which is the land knows how to grow willow trees and can do a way better job than we can. And if there's some specific problem, yeah, you know, you help out there, but the real point is to have the land do what the land knows best. Is this, so what are, you, what are you thinking about all that? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's why I think when, you know, asked the question about what about land restoration, um, you know, we feel like, oh, boy, this is going to be a big answer because <laughs> it really is more about the root causes. Um, and so that is that is the direction our work is going in. Um, I will say, though, that, you know, there's certainly, like you, there are individual species we love, and so we, we do little things for them <laughs> as we can. And I think that's a good thing, too. But, um, well, you know, I kind of... I think wanted to answer some of the other parts of your question back there, uh, moving on sort of through these concepts that, you know, most of us would agree that climate change is probably the biggest planetary threat to biological integrity and that we need to do everything we can to end the current way of life based on fossil fuels. But climate change can't be stopped, in our opinion, by ending fossil fuel use alone. 
we have to change all of the extractive land practices that are contributing to the crisis. So the destruction of biological integrity caused by almost all of the agricultural, grazing, logging practices that we see currently in our watershed and elsewhere are a major cause of climate change. And th this has been a pretty big part of our work in the last year or more is uh, studying the work of a number of people in the soil carbon and new water paradigm movements who are describing this in detail. And if it's okay, I'll just mention some of the names because I think it's it's really significant work going on. Um, Victor Gorshkov and Anastasia Makareva on how forests act like a biotic pump, pulling the moisture that they need to them as rainfall. So uh, this work is really giving a scientific backbone to uh, what we so <laughs> most of us hopefully know, but that um, rain follows forests. And uh, Christine Jones on how plants build soil and store carbon directly through active biochemical processes, not just through decay. So we need as much photosynthesis going on above ground and as deeply rooted plants below ground as possible. Uh, people like Alan Savory on reversing desertification through using domesticated grazing animals to replace the missing megafauna uh, to restore nutrient and water cycles. And you know, as I said, once you understand the principles of what's being described by these people, you realize that it's something you already know if you're paying attention to the land, uh, you know, that rainfall is heavier in forested areas and that large tracts of, of bare soil feel like they're baking and radiating in heat and that the more plants you have on any given piece of soil, the more healthy that soil will be. So to do this work, we're, we're constantly asking questions about what's happening around us with regards to soil and water. So, you know, some examples, uh, you know, will this cool burn that uh, Brian did of a large tract of star thistle last fall help favor perennial grasses, which are more deeply rooted and build soil? Um, you know, this, the cool burns were a uh, major land care practice of the indigenous here. Um, but there are many questions about whether these burns would actually be too destructive to soil in its current state, uh, since we are in such a, a crisis state. Uh, and then, you know, with the grazing, huge questions about whether uh, thatch is actually building up in our grasslands that would cause the kind of desertification that Alan Savory describes. Um, this is a whole area that I think needs a, a great deal more observation and research, but is really promising. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how we're using this focus of, um, of work. And, and as Brian said, it's, it's a lot of things. It's doing the work here on the land so that we can actually say, yes, we did this, we observed this, and we would advise this practice. So that's really important. Um, it's also um, talking, certainly, to other people in the region and gaining that knowledge as well um, so that we can begin to sort of have a, a knowledge base of what might be promoting better health in um, the water and, and soil here in our region. Um, I, have, I have a question that goes a little bit different direction, or maybe the same direction, but did you want to add anything to that, Brian? Oh, I, I think I might want to go back to where you left off before Marie um, answered that part, which was, um, yes, it's, it's, you're basically saying one of the best things we can do is just let the land do what it knows to do. And, you know, our language for that tends to be, we call it the evolutionary process. Um, and we really do see that as the basis of, of restoration. If we do whatever we can to help facilitate the evolutionary process, that, that's, that's all we can do. Because um, really, the natural world knows what it's doing, and we'll take care of the rest. I think, <clears throat> I think that's all great. And I think, for me, part of it has to do with what one is really trying to accomplish. And I think about this a lot, that whenever I hear 
somebody talk about forest management or range management or fisheries management, I always feel like I want to either grab a gun or throw up. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, that's funny. We've been very steeped in um, the literature of holistic management is now the new buzzword, but um, that's why we, we prefer the term land care practices. But um, there is something to the idea of the way it's talked about is managing for something, and I think there is a fair amount to be learned from that. For instance, indigenous people in this area manage for um, – very robust, healthy oak trees that would supply food for themselves and for um, a, a range of animals. So the, there, there is, you know, I, it's all semantics, but um, I can understand your feelings. Yeah. Well, I, well, the the point I was trying to get to was that um, they so often when somebody says management, especially when managers say management, what they're meaning is how much can we extract without destroying it completely? And I think that's why I said that for me intent is really key because if one is attempting to, and I'm still not comfortable with the word manage, but if one is, is attempting to manage for um, maximum biological integrity, then um, you know I keep thinking about a line that I really learned from John Livingston, which I, is is just so obvious, is so evident, self-evidently true, but I, I can't believe that n not many people seem to get this, which is there's this great line, there is no surplus in nature. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that every bit of, every every bite that you take, every time you remove a food from the, uh, every time you move, remove a fish from a creek, um, that's not to say you should never remove a fish from the creek, but every time you remove a fish from a creek, that is one fish that somebody else can't eat. And once again, I'm not saying that one should never remove anything from the land, but one should be if you attempt if you're attempting to manage to see how much you can steal to sort of sustained yield stealing, that's a whole whole different thing than attempting to insert yourself into the or, or see, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there's this great line by Dolores La Chapelle where she talked about how evolution is not based on survival of the fittest, as in how that means in a capitalistic sense, the one who can compete the most and exploit the most, but instead survival of the fit, by which she meant how well you fit into the land base, how well you are able to incorporate yourself into the land base in a way that helps both you and the land. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's that's what we see. And for that me, that for me that doesn't end up. And you know, I, I I don't mean to get stuck on the word management, but for me that ends up that's not management. That's just that's just being in relationship. Yeah, and I I think that's one of the reasons that part of our work at the center is that we really stress that the only uh, sustainable way for humans to live in any region, and and we try to to elaborate on what it would mean in our region is subsistence living. So if you're looking at that through, you know, the lens of subsistence living, you're going to take the fish you need to survive and that's it. Uh, and it's very different to look at it through the the lens of an economy that demands extraction. So uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's why whatever words we use that we feel it's it's okay to take from a land base for your own subsistence needs if you are living in relationship with it appropriately. Well, and the question becomes um what is actually happening to the the nutrients that you are what's happening to the soil. So, you know, you take a fish from the creek and then you eat it and then you poop it out what you've done is essentially no different than a bear who would eat the fish and then poop it out. What you've done is you've moved, I mean, and I don't mean to to not acknowledge the death of the fish, but, you know, life feeds off life. And what you've done is you've moved the nutrients from the stream up to the grass, which is one of the things that has to happen in in a functioning riparian slash grassland area. 
I mean, I think about that with salmon. That salmon, and I was thinking about this when you were talking about biological integrity. That, that you know, salmon are in some ways the backbone of a salmon-based forest. And um, the one of the, <laughs> and I hate to talk about this so mechanistically, but one of the functions of bears then is to eat the salmon at the stream and then walk 300 yards away and poop the salmon out underneath a tree, who then gets the nutrients from the salmon. And so, yeah, that's that's all. You know, I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but I've, and and maybe this is just something I've been thinking about. And so, if this is something you don't care about, then we don't need to talk about it at all. But I've been thinking that in some ways, the functional, the sort of biological, sort of the the fundamental unit of evolution, I don't believe is in any way the individual. I, I believe the fundamental unit of evolution is the is the entire community. I, I would almost say it's also the niche that 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 community is it serves uh within the greater community so um absolutely well, tell, tell me what the, you mean the by bear, that so the bear you know in your analogy the bear is is um serving serving the rest of life by eating the fish and pooping it out right there right and um and that's that is really a lot of the way we try to think about um helping biological integrity is who's playing what role. So, for instance, on our land here, um, you know, as I said, there, there's a lot of theory out there at this point about how our landscapes are affected by the missing megafauna. And, I mean, if you look at that, what, 15,000 years ago, there were sloths and all manner of creatures right here um, where we're sitting, and the plant community was the, almost the same. So, so these plants that we're we're around right now evolved with a very different set of of um, animals with them, and so there's a lot of question about missing relationships, um, particularly with grasses missing uh, the grazers, uh, but there's also just missing literally the the fertilization of the land by megafauna coming through, um, breaking up material, helping it go back to the soil, and and putting the nutrients back in the form of dung and such. So, um, no, it's it's very relevant, and I think I think that that is that fundamental um, unit of evolution is is the the community or the role that that community plays. So we have about. Um... We have about six or seven minutes left. And the first thing I would like to ask sort of to start our, our wind down. Well, first off, before we start the wind down, are there any other major topics you want to cover before we start the slow wind down? Well, um, you know, one one topic that's completely related to all this um, is desertification. I mean, that's a word that I guess gets used a lot, um, particularly in the um, the grazing the grazing world, um, and for us, it's you know it's totally related to climate change, um, and probably it's good just to give a little definition of desertification. Um, you know, it's the process of transition from non-desert to desert, and that really simply means forests becoming grasslands, grasslands becoming scrublands, and then scrublands becoming desert. Um, and, you know, that's usually a pretty slow, gradual process. Um, but, you know, ever since the advent of powerful tractors and earth-moving machines, it can happen very quickly. And here in California's Great Valley, desertification is on a fast track due to the mile after mile after mile of uh, bare soil between the rows of uh, row crops and orchard trees. Um and it's it's a significant uh, part of the drying up, the, the loss of water, the, the change in the rain patterns here. And um, you know, I think there's a there's an astonishing fact that I've recently learned that 65% of all the fresh water on this planet is stored in soil. Um, and when you think of it that way, and then you go out and you look at these vast industrial agricultural tracts where there's just mile after mile of bare ground. Uh, it really makes you see with that. I mean, it's uh, well. For one thing, it's just heartbreaking. It really makes you see that there is no way that that type of um, 
that, that use of land could ever be sustainable. Um, and it, it, there's a term that's come from reading about all this from a man named Peter Donovan of the Soil Carbon Coalition, who recently coined this term called sunshine spills to create a parallel with oil spills to try to get the point across about the effect of bare earth on atmospheric CO2. And of course, you know, this is the standard practice of industrial agriculture and it's devastating to water cycles everywhere. Um, so our, our work actually, we, that's part of what we're combating. We feel like we have to start with this region is woodland. It's moving towards grassland. We want to try to stop that. Uh, we want to, there's plenty of signs that desertification is, is has begun in pretty much throughout all of California and certainly almost all of the western U.S. You know, I always think about something that my friend John Osborne talks about, about how um, the reason he does the work that he does is because we can't predict the future, and he wants to make sure that as things become increasingly chaotic that some doors remain open. And what he means by that is, you know, if the forest where I live is still standing in 10 years, it may still be here in 100. But if it's gone in 10 years, then then the damage is done. So I keep thinking about the phrase, not on my watch. So it's like, you know, with that land there, it's like you'll do everything you can to make sure that it doesn't become more desertified in your lifetime. That, you know, it's, Absolutely. I keep thinking about the whole point of my book, What We Leave Behind, is... The point of life is to leave the world, not the society, not simply human communities. But the point of life is to leave the world a better place than be, leave the world a better place because you were born. Mm -hmm. And yeah, ab absolutely, Derek. I I love that book. Thank you for that. And um, and just the title itself is is something I kind of keep in mind. Um, and uses a guideline, you know, frequently. What do I want to have accomplished when I'm gone? I would love to know that this watershed is in better shape uh, than when I first came here. So um, I guess I would touch on that a little bit in that, you know, effectiveness is really important to us um, because in order to really accomplish that, you have to keep measuring your effectiveness. Um, so, you know, it's all well and good to have these ideas, but, but how are you actually helping this creek, this watershed? And... Um, and that it kind of comes back to what we were saying that it, on many levels, and we're just beginning this work, but we are trying to normalize same land care practices in this region. And, you know, we want people to think differently. We want more and more people to know that they shouldn't cut down healthy oaks. We want more and more people to uh, never look at an oak as firewood until it falls down on its own. You know, we want more and more people to know that if beavers cut cottonwoods or alders on their land, they don't think of trapping or killing them, but uh, instead are happy that they're there because they're benefiting the watershed. Um, and, you know, more and more people to know that an abundance of vegetation along a creek is, is positive for the water cycle instead of this idea that it sucks the creek dry. Um, and certainly in... In California right now, very relevant that uh, people stop thinking that there's a drought, we need more reservoirs. It's like, no, there's a drought, we need to really change the way we live. So, Well, I was going to ask, <laughs> I was going to sort of conclude by asking what you want people to do with the information, but I think you just answered that. Um, <laughs> and is there, is there, so given um, people who are um, both people who who have land that they can help to restore and then people who don't have land themselves, maybe they live in an apartment. Um, so is there anything besides what you've already said that you would want people to take away from this interview? Um, yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so to, I'll address actually those who don't have land because uh, my experience is that you're likely to put more effort into whatever work you do and therefore be more effective uh, if you live with a land base that you love. Now, if you don't have land, but you certainly can go out and be with the natural world wherever you are, um, I, I would recommend that you spend a lot of time with non-humans. And, um, you know, basically fall in love with every living creature you can. 
I think that's a, a great starting point for anyone, whether you own land or not. Um, and you know what we would love to see is that 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 love for life um, becomes core to a radical environmental movement. You know, the sense of I love the life where I am, so this is what I need to do to help this place. And of, of course, we would like to see. Um, an organization like ours sprout up in every watershed. We think that, uh, going back to restoration, restoration is, is very locale specific. There's so much knowledge just about each little place that would require uh, understanding what it would take to support biological integrity in those places. So we would love to see that, and we would certainly be happy to help in whatever way we can. Um, and, of course, we are recruiting for our our organization. So um, you can check out our website at eldercreek.org. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work, and thank you for caring for the land. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guests today have been Marie and Brian Brennan. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs> 